Hey, it's Clayton again. Welcome back to HowToDrawComics.net. In part one of this series, we started from the ground up, as we learned how to create a solid foundation for a comic book illustration. In part two, we took that base sketch, and we used it as a guide to layer in the final line art right in over the top. And now here, in this video, I'll show you how to add lighting and details to your comic book creations to bring them to a whole new level of dimension as I share with you my personal rendering and shading techniques. I hope you enjoy the video. Let's not kid ourselves, shadows can be incredibly confusing to pull off correctly. And there's a good reason for it. We forget about the light source. Without thinking about where the lights are in the scene at all times, how are we going to know what will be lit up and what will be left in shadow? When it comes to blocking in your shadows, it's a matter of consistency, full stop. Ensuring that whatever falls into shadow, whatever casts shadow and how much shadow should be used is as consistent as possible according to the light direction. Here you'll see I've in fact used three blue 3D arrows to figure out where the light in my scene is coming from. As I create the shadows for the folds and the clothing, I distribute the amount of shadow based more on how the underlying forms are turning away from the light. So as the cylindrical form of the legs of the security guard fold off into shadow for example, there is a greater amount of wrinkles blackened in there. And of course, heading up toward the core highlights where the light is projected onto the form at its most intense, those shadows begin to break up. The effect this is actually creating by the way, is a very subtle gradient between black and white that helps describe the underlying cylindrical form of his leg. That just about does the basic block in for my shadows. Now let's talk about textures, because at the moment Harley's hammer could be made of anything. It could be a metal bucket on the end of a stick, or it could be a giant tree stump. So I'm going to get the wavy shapes of the barky wood grain drawn in first. And, as I draw, I'm applying line weights to create subtle recesses in the texture that actually do make it appear textured. As if you could almost feel the bumps of the wood underneath your finger when you ran it across the hammer. Once the general gist of the texture is done, I'm going to stop and leave it there. I really don't want to go overboard on the details just yet. Not until the final rendering phase. So let's turn our attention now to those luscious locks of hair atop Harley's head. First course of action here is to break up some of those larger clumps into smaller clumps. It's important to remember here that although her hair is made up of lots of tiny strands, those strands are actually grouped together into locks that split off from one another to form its overall shape and style. Next I'll give the hair some volume by pushing the underlying layers of hair back with shadow and once those layers of locks are broken up and we've added in some shadows to create depth, it's time to describe the form of the layers themselves to really give Harley's hair a whole new level of dimension. And this is where our first pass of rendering is going to come into play. What we're attempting to achieve here is to create a gradient from dark to light that not only helps to describe the form, but also adds a silky shine to the surface of the hair. Okay, so what are the nuts and bolts of this rendering technique? Well, basically, we're going to use a lineup of thin, evenly spaced render lines that are drawn out from the shadows and up toward the core highlights. Now, as these render lines are drawn out, their trajectory will curve along the surface of the hair's layer. The length of the render lines will determine how sharp and soft the transition from black to white is. The shorter the render lines, the harder the gradient. And of course vice versa, the longer they are, the more widespread the gradient will become. Remember too that though we're using only black and white tones to create this image, the rendering lines basically give us the illusion of tonal variance. What this simply means is that we can push certain areas back into darkness without blacking them out completely. So let's go ahead now and wrinkle up her blouse. The rule of thumb here is to remember that the folds and creases rendered into the material will be completely determined on what it's wrapped around. Meaning that as we render the wrinkles into Harley's getup, the broader forms below, such as the breasts and ribcage, are simultaneously described. Here's where the clothes get really crazy though. 
It's not only the forms that they wrap around that determine where and how the creases will appear, but also the material itself, and how tightly or loosely it hugs against the body. The puffed out sleeves on Harley's blouse, for example, sit a lot more loosely than where it's tightly buttoned up above her corset. You can see the difference in tension. Conversely, the looser and thicker the fabric becomes, the broader and more voluminous the folds are. With Harley Quinn's clothes thoroughly unironed, it's time to really ramp up the background details. In terms of lighting, the floor won't have a lot of tonal variance. So the role rendering will play in this instance is to create texture in the tiles by recessing the chunks that have been chipped off. This is actually a super simple texturing technique that packs a big punch visually. Think of it like this. By default, white is the default tone for the tiles. As soon as we begin drawing rendering lines down onto the chipped off areas, they work together to create a tone darker than white. It's important to remember, by the way, that the closer and more densely drawn the lines are, the darker the tone they create will be. Since this tone is darker than white, those areas are now embossed into the floor tile, making it appear as though they have been chipped off. This same rendering technique also comes in mighty useful for creating soft shadows. Here the plan will be to create a widespread, light to dark gradient down the length of the wall behind Harley. This of course will add to the environmental lighting overall, but it will also help Harley to stand out a little more by adding a nice contrast between her and the background. The bottom of the wall will almost be completely covered in rendering lines, since that's where most of the soft shadows will cluster. Let's say I want to then bring the gradient out into a lighter tone. Well, that's easily done too by simply breaking up the render lines as they track up the wall toward the light. This varies the distance between them and effectively creates a brighter tone by diluting their density. Okay, let's talk about how we can continue creating this gradient effect, while at the same time adding to the roughage of the wall behind Harley Quinn. Because in case you couldn't tell already, I'm really gunning for that ultra grungy, dilapidated look. Leaving those walls clean and pristine just isn't Arkham Asylum style. So I'm going to go right in there with a metaphorical jackhammer to bust the place up a bit. Hopefully this will give the environment just the right amount of decay and general lack of upkeep I'm looking for. To do that, the plan is to create a flat gradient from dark to light on the surrounding walls. The main difference being here that the render lines I'm using to do that get caught in and around the chipped away areas of plaster and cement. In technical drawing terms, I simply begin by outlining the shapes where the wall has been damaged, and then throw in some line weights around the top contours to create a nice indentation. Sometimes I might leave out the bottom half of the shape completely to really push that stamped in 3D effect. Inside these shapes, I'll draw out some tightly packed render lines from the top, taking them all the way down to just before the bottom edge. This creates a nifty embossed layering effect that causes the wall to appear as though it's almost been eaten away. Again, this is just adding to that grungy, dank atmosphere I'm looking for in this piece. As the wall starts to transition into lighter values from the bottom, the damage effects, along with the rendering, begin to break up and subside. This is really a kind of visual trickery to indicate the shading for the environment overall in relation to the light source. Close up, it might look like individual nicks of detail, but ideally from a distance, all of that comes together to indicate subtle tonal shifts in the environment's lighting scheme. As I mentioned before, the dimmer tones created by the render lines behind Harley Quinn will begin to make her pop off of the page as they contrast against her lighter values. Of course, I do this on purpose because out of everything else in this illustration, Harley is the main center of focus. Using contrast in this way is a great technique for getting the things you want viewers to take notice of in your comic book illustrations to actually stand out. In saying that, let's talk about the different ways we can control contrast here to intensify those tones and also to make the surface of the wall appear even more beaten up. 
This involves ramping up the contrast of those broken layers of plastered concrete so that the darker tones become even more intense. Tonal intensity is increased by throwing down some adjacent rendering lines across those I've already drawn in. Now you might very well already be familiar with this true and tried technique, cross hatching. Basically what happens in effect is the double up of cross hatched rendering lines creates more density, resulting in an even darker tone. The blending of these tones can be controlled of course by breaking up the cross hatching and distributing it more sparsely as the gradient fades into lighter values. I add in cross hatches wherever I want to give some lift to the textured layering of the wall as well as where I think the soft shadows could be a little darker. As you can see around the top of the wall, around the light fixture and the pipes, that shading gets rather dense. For the most part, the rendering lines are all kept uniform to make sure the grayscale tones are leveled out evenly. I like to be careful about this though because it can make the artwork look a little automated, a little too neat and tidy. So I like to add in a touch of variation within the rendering lines by breaking them up a bit and adding small nicks and dots of detail around the place to give it some character. You can see the smaller areas of damage across the wall are randomized in size and placement, but still in a way that fits in compositionally with everything else. This makes the illustration look more natural because in the real world, that's just kind of how things are. Organized variation. It all depends on the environment you're drawing, of course. In a sterile lab scene, which is super clean and well maintained, you can make a good bet that the randomized variation will be replaced with a neat and tidy, well kept aesthetic. But you still might throw in a few stray papers, cabling, computer monitors, and off center filing cabinets to actually make it less like a display lab and more like a real one. It's those subtle details that make all the difference and often adds loads to the story you're telling while doing so. What makes this style of rendering so unique is that it serves to be very much multi-purpose in the sense that on the one hand, you can use it to shade and create contrast. Yet on the other hand, it can be used to create textures and to add in detailing effects. With a variety of uses like this though, Knowing the technique will only get you so far. Because a lot of the decisions you make along the way as to where and how much rendering should be added into your comic art becomes a gut instinct type scenario. It comes down to a general feel and judgment that ultimately only you can decide, since rendering and detail really are what leaves the artist's stamp of individuality within their work. The interesting part is that the detailing, shading, and rendering phase itself doesn't really require all that much technical thinking. With a large amount of the background walls completed, I'm going to jump into drawing the shading and details in for the security guard. As you can see, most of the guard's anatomy is covered up by his uniform. So now we have an opportunity to take a closer look at how to render clothing specifically. Despite the folds and wrinkles of the material, the easiest way to render clothing straight up is to keep in mind the underlying form it's wrapped around, as I said earlier. It makes sense really. After all, a stocking on its own is just a, a flat piece of material. Stuff it with a cube, a cylinder, or a spherical block, and that stocking's form suddenly conforms to whatever shape it's filled with. You can think of these base cylindrical and spherical shapes that make up the legs, arms, and body of our guard here as primary forms, and the wrinkles and folds of his uniform as secondary forms. Those primary forms determine the way the secondary forms are rendered. For the clothing folds themselves, I use smaller rendering lines since oftentimes their tube-like forms are quite sharp and thin. The open areas within them, which sit directly against the leg, are shaded with longer render lines to create a softer gradient. This goes without saying, but again, to get this right, the key thing to remember at all times is the lighting direction. As you can see, the background is quickly becoming very busy, and this is really where the ability to balance details and rendering becomes super important. Because otherwise, what we'll end up with is a visually unreadable, muddy mess. The issue we have here though, is that working in so closely on the different parts of the illustration to detail it out, 
makes it hard to know how the comic art is coming together as a whole. So how do we combat that? How can we ensure that the viewer doesn't become disorientated by all that detail? Well, there are a few things we can use here to strategically structure all that high density detail in such a way that we can almost guarantee our artwork won't transcend into a blurry mess. Which kind of relates to my first tip here. Squinting your eyes to blur your vision. Sounds strange, I know, but basically what this allows you to do is to change your focus from the individual details inside your comic art, such as the rendering lines, to view the actual tones and contrast they've been put there to create. If you can't make out the forms or you're finding it hard to tell what it is you're looking at in the illustration, then it's highly likely the rendering and details are not balanced correctly. The other really useful tool you can use to check whether or not the detail in your comic art is reading right is the navigator panel. Now, if you've never used this before, you're probably wondering what the heck I'm talking about. Well, the navigator panel is actually found inside the application I'm drawing my illustration of Harley Quinn in, Manga Studio. In fact, you might be able to spot the navigator panel in the upper right hand corner of the screen there. Now the main function of the navigator panel is to allow you to do just that. Navigate quickly around your artwork when you're zoomed in close in the main window. Most graphics applications such as Photoshop also have a navigator panel that does very much the same thing. But the biggest advantage to having it up there is that it shows you the entire illustration from a distance. Again, what this means is your attention is taken away from all those individual details and instead you're able to tell straight away whether or not the artwork is reading properly as a whole. The coolest part about this is I can glance over at the navigator panel on the fly as I'm working to make sure all is coming along smoothly. Remember Harley Quinn Sammer? At the start of this video, the bark was drawn in around the stump. But to really chisel out Harley Quinn's heavy duty bat beater to perfection, there's just a bit more detail left to dabble in here. Now I was worried that Harley's hammer might be getting slightly lost against the background. So I figured it would be best to begin by adding in some heavier line weights around the outside edges of the hammer to help make it stand out. Beyond that, the bark texture I've drawn in so far really adds enough to the detailing on its own. So I'm not trying to overdo the rendering here. Sometimes it's hard to figure out how to tackle different textures, because the way you use the rendering will often differ from material to material. For example, I would likely take a completely different approach to say beaten metal than to the wood I'm rendering here. Experimentation is key. Not everything you try will work, but when it does, take note and add it to your archive of texturing techniques. At the end of the day, sometimes the first rendering pass is not necessarily the best. And if something's just not quite looking right, then that's it, it must be addressed. Harley Quinn's boob shading presented such a situation and it was because the rendering lines were just so dense that the light to dark fall off wasn't quite soft enough. Less cross hatching and longer rendering lines were the remedy to attend to this hiccup and ultimately it was another less is more type scenario. I have a tendency, I think, to sometimes go all out with the cross hatching when really it's just not necessary. Knowing this, I've made it a habit of mine to place my cross hatches on a second layer in Manga Studio above the rendering lines I've already laid down, just in case I decide at some point that they need to go. So, rendering is a bit of an art form in and of itself. It takes time to become a true wizard with the technique. I can't tell you, no one can really tell you when to use rendering or how to use it. It tends to be left up to your own judgement. I mean, take Harley Quinn's corset here for example. I could have drawn in the rendering lines in a horizontal direction on each of the segments. But instead I drew them in vertically. Why? What was the thinking behind it? Well it was honestly just because I thought it worked better for capturing the desired look I was going for. Having the rendering lines run straight up and down instead of crossways, and by gradually adjusting their length and spacing, this approach simply did the best job in creating the soft fall off I wanted to fade into the shaded areas of her lower body. If the rendering isn't quite sitting right for you in one direction, erase it and try another tactic and tweak the rendering lines until you get just the right gradient. Alrighty, winding up this comic book illustration now, 
I'm drawing in Harley's fishnet stockings. The important thing to remember here is that the netted part of her leg should be drawn on in such a way that it follows around the cylindrical form of her thigh. Paying close attention to the curvature of the stocking lines and the way Harley's leg is foreshortened is what's really helping me out here. And just before we wind up, there's a little more damage control needed where Harley's hand is concerned. Again, I'm a picky perfectionist when it comes to my artwork, and her hand was ever so slightly not sized up correctly. So I place a translucent piece of digital tracing paper on a new layer above the rest of the illustration, and begin quickly whipping up a new and improved hand that'll hopefully please me more than the last. And now it's time to add the last few cherries to the cake, where with a keen eye, I fill in the easy to miss blanks with a few last dabs of detail and rendering. Sometimes these smaller, seemingly insignificant parts of the illustration manage to slip underneath the radar. And it often happens when my attention is divided between parts of the illustration that need fixing and the areas that are still left to be finished. Or sometimes they're just not as fun to work on so they get neglected. We're ready to sign off and call it a wrap, folks. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, remember to subscribe for more comic art tutorials. If you'd like to be kept in the loop on up and coming videos, articles, tips and tricks, you can also subscribe to the howtodrawcomics.net newsletter. Until next time, see you later.